Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to University of Toronto Robotics Institute seminars. Uh, we are very glad to have you, whether you're watching this live or in, after, the, after the event. It gives me great pleasure to invite Shuran Song here. Uh, I've known Shuran through Shuran's excellent work over the many years. Shuran is currently an Aston professor in computer science at Columbia University, where she also directs the lab uh, of AI and robotics care. Uh, her research really has spanned from computer vision to robotics. And over the years, she has actually been very influential on many core ideas uh, of applying machine learning for vision in robotics. Her work invariably has done exceptionally well. She has been part of many uh, best papers, best systems papers. Uh, uh, it would be too many to even count the number of times she keeps winning best papers award. It puts us to shame. Uh, at the same time, she has also been uh, uh, very prolific. She has been awarded the 2022 Sloan Research Fellowship, 2021 Microsoft Research Faculty Fellowship, uh, JP Morgan Faculty Fellowship 2021, TRI Young Fellowship, uh, and Amazon Research Award in 21, 2020 as well. I think the awards would be too many to count, uh, but let me let me share one personal anecdote. I think her work has been very influential in the sense that it's not only one papers, but she has been uh, arguing for a particular brand of work, which is using vision very differently from what roboticists conventionally use. Uh, I have asked all of my students to follow her and literally read almost all of her papers. We work on topics that are very, very common. Uh, at the same time, uh, she has a flair for doing not only very good robot demos, but also use, use of simulation and real robots simultaneously that has been visible through papers such as Tossing Bot. The video that you see playing is a wonderful example as well. So without further ado, I, I would like to welcome Shuran again. Thank you for making time and over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. And it's uh, so, so nice to be here and uh, uh, nice to meet with everybody. Yeah, so I think before I start, I just want to mention that there is a few link on my first uh, slide that's basically pointing to the product webpage. Just in case that there are any like uh, network issues or Zoom issues that you're not able to see the video in full resolution, uh, those are the videos that you can check out uh, afterwards or at the same time. Okay, yeah, so today my talk is about dynamic manipulation for deformable objects. And hopefully uh, by the end of the talk, you think you'll kind of agree with me that it is a good idea, um, but let's start. Okay, so I always like to start my talk by kind of just reminding ourselves uh, how common deformable objects are in our everyday life. Right, so here is kind of a typical morning routine for most of us. And uh, I think within the first uh, hours of our day, we kind of already interact with a, a wide variety of deformable objects, uh, like your blankets, your t-shirt, your uh, towels, right? And then we can easily manipulate all of them um, even before we fully wake up. However, uh, this kind of seemingly trivial task for us that's actually manipulating different type of uh, deformable objects uh, is still a quite like, I, I would say open challenge for many of today's robotic systems. And, um, and many of uh, our today's robots are kind of uh, specifically designed to handle rigid objects and also kind of featured with this kind of very rigid movement. So however, from a different from um, rigid objects, which is typically what we are um, considering when we think about robot manipulation, deformable objects often has much more complex dynamics. Um, due to their uh, extremely high uh, degree of freedom and typically sometimes people even think it's as near infinite degree of freedoms. Um, and also I think what makes things even worse is that among all those uh, degree of freedoms on a deformable objects, uh, only a very small number of them or small portion of them can be actually directly controlled by a robot through direct contact. Uh, so yeah, in other words, the system is often um, highly underactuated. So for example, when a robot is holding a piece of cloth like in this uh, picture, all it can control is a very small region on the cloth that's around a scraper, while the rest of the cloth is just kind of hanging there and uh, the robot does not have any direct control over those out of contact positions. So, um, and, and in addition to, um, sorry, so as a result, uh, because of those uh, like highly underactuated system, 
Uh, those typical actions that we are designed for rigid objects, like pick and place actions, are often highly inefficient uh, for deformable objects manipulation. Because at each time, uh, each of the action can only affect a small region on the cars. And uh, in addition to efficiency, this kind of action also kind of limits the range of tasks a system can perform. Right? So for example, if the objects or the class is larger than the robot's physical reach range, like for example, if a bag is bigger than the, the robot's uh, physical reach range, then the, the system will never able to kind of uh, fully unfold or manipulate that um, class because of the, uh, the limited physical workspace. So this kind of uh, the choice of dynamic, um, quasi static action has kind of becoming one of the common limitations for many prior works uh, in class manipulation. So although over uh, the past 20 years, there has been many sophisticated algorithms that developed to model um, that uh, deformable objects, the resulting system or the resulting robotic system oftentimes still kind of inefficient and uh, where they can easily take hundreds of steps just to kind of uh, manipulate a small piece of car. However, uh, on the other hand, uh, we human actually manipulate deformable objects in a very different manner. Right? So we often use very fast and fluid mo uh, motion that fully leverage the dynamics of the deformable object in order to quickly uh, achieve our goal. And uh, formally, we can kind of categorize these two types of manipulation strategy as uh, dynamic and the quasi-static manipulation. So the main difference uh, between these two strategies is that in quasi-static manipulation, the system will try to try its best to avoid any task dynamics by using slow or careful movement. And it kind of assumes that the whole system is static as soon as the robot stops move, uh, moving. And on the other hand, dynamic manipulation will actually um, instead try to embrace and leverage those um, task dynamics or object dynamics in order to more efficiently manipulate an object. So fundamentally, what dynamic manipulation allows uh, the system to do is to make use of the accelerations in the action in order to control those out of contact positions on the objects, therefore obtain more control over the total degree of freedoms of a deformable object. Um, so this capability is actually, um, I would say that's directly addressing one of the core challenge for deformable object manipulation that is caused by their high degree of freedom and under actuation. And here are just a, a quick examples of um, dynamic manipulation strategies that applied on deformable objects, such as a uh, fling um, folded class, so to unfold it, or swing a rope, or um, open uh, a deformable bag with active air. So in those examples, we can also kind of highlight uh, the locations on the objects that has been manipulated by the system or the robot, however, not directly in contact with the robot throughout the whole manipulation process. And uh, so I guess uh, if the dynamic uh, action or manipulation is so well suited for deformable object manipulation, uh, then a natural question to ask is why we haven't seen it uh, being used in most of the robot systems. And what are the main barriers uh, for applying dynamic manipulation on deformable objects? So I think I, I try to summarize with three main reasons, but maybe there are more. Uh, so I think the first the challenge is um, about the action, um, the complexities in the action sequence. Um, so for example, if we are uh, designing a robot system that's using pick and place action, uh, this kind of action can be easily parameterized with only uh, three locations that where to pick, where to place. However, if we want to specify uh, a dynamic action, we also need to kind of specify the velocity and accelerations in, the, in those action. So they are potentially more complex um, and uh, therefore learn the learning algorithms that are designed for learning uh, dynamic manipulation also need to kind of tackle the problem of expanded uh, parameter space. So that's the first challenge. And I think the second challenge is about the complex object dynamics. Uh, since the object's uh, motion under dynamic action uh, is highly influenced by its physical properties. And uh, many of them uh, are actually very hard to measure, like frictions or aerodynamics, and uh, especially for deformable objects, uh, for example, stiffness. So therefore, it really requires the policy or the algorithm to actually adapt to, this, uh, to all those kind of hard to measure parameters. And I think the last challenge is uh, seem to real guys. Uh, I think at this moment, cloud simulators is still kind of far from perfect, especially when dynamics are involved. 
So this means that we really need a system that can either um, effectively train in real world through either self-suppressed learning or other method, or able to kind of robustly adapt, um, perform this kind of sim to real adaptation uh, when training in uh, like imperfect simulators. So those are, I, I think, the three main challenge for applying dynamic manipulation in deformable object manipulation. So in today's talk, I will try to show some possible solutions for those challenges and with the three of our recent works. And we'll start uh, with relatively simple tasks like cross unfolding that may not require very precise control to start with, and then move towards to uh, those kind of more challenging tasks that are actually goal conditions and also have a higher requirements on the action position. So first, uh, let's uh, talk about Fringba. I think this is our first attempt of uh, using dynamic manipulation for the task of uh, class unfolding. So class unfolding uh, is actually a very simple task. Uh, it has a very simple objective, which is just to maximize the visible surface area of a class. So this task is also a very common first step for almost any class manipulation pipeline. Right? So if you want to fold the class uh, into a certain configuration, the first step is very likely to unfold it. Right? So, and also by unfolding the class, you are able to kind of see the key features on the, on the class so that you can recognize it better. Um, however, just like many tasks in robotics, while the objective is simple, uh, doing the task um, efficiently and uh, robustly uh, is still pretty hard for robots. Uh, so here uh, I'm showing you a simple system uh, of two robot arms that is trained to unfold the t-shirt using the um, kind of typical pick and place action. And you can see that it takes very long time uh, for the system to make some small progress. And if the class is larger than the robot's uh, maximum reach range, then the class will never be fully unfolded because of the physical limitations. And uh, what that means in real life is that if your blanket is longer than your arm, uh, you are never able to fully unfold it, uh, which is not, not very ideal. But obviously, that's not how we would unfold a blanket in the morning. Um, and instead, we are probably going to do something similar to uh, this, right? So where we are going to grasp the cloth with two hands and then fling it uh, with uh, some high velocity in order to fully unfold it. So this example kind of shows that what's really missing in our robot system is the capability of using high velocity dynamic manipulation, uh, which is also the key idea behind fling bond. So using this idea, we uh, designed a fling bond that used this dynamic action of fling in order to uh, perform the task of class unfolding. And it's able to achieve over 80% of coverage within uh, three interaction steps. Um, the system also works on class that is larger than its physical range and able to generalize to different shape of garments when it's only trained on rectangle uh, cloth. So how we actually uh, do that? Uh, so this is our physical setup. Um, and in our experiments, we use the two UR, uh, UR5 robot arm and also two RGBD camera. One is kind of taking uh, a frontal view of the workspace, uh, which is used to kind of um, have a um, observation of the class after it's being picked up. And the, the second camera is looking top down and uh, this camera is used to predicting grass positions. And then what the algorithm needs to do is to take the image as input and output the parameters of, uh, for the fling primitive, which we're gonna talk about in a bit. And after each of the uh, interaction uh, steps, the top-down camera will capture the image of the class uh, before and after this interaction and uh, compute the coverage of the class um, and use that as a supervision signal. Basically, the bigger coverage that we increase with this action, uh, the better this action is. So that is the uh, like self-supervision signal that we use to train the policy. Uh, and in the end of each episode, the system will also can, uh, automatically reset uh, the state by uh, randomly pick up the class and drop it back to the workspace. So as a result, the whole system is able to uh, learn with only self-supervision uh, with a very uh, minimal human intervention. So from time to time, we need to switch the class, but within one training period, they can just kind of automatically reset and collect data by itself. So uh, here is uh, more details about our fling primitives. So our um, uh, fling primitive actually involves several steps, uh, which is first uh, pick up the class and then stretch, it, uh, stretch it and then fling it with a high velocity and then finally place it down in the workspace. And in order to perform this primitive, what the system needs to do is to choose the right parameters uh, for each of the steps, such as where to pick, 
uh, how far to stretch and how fast to fling, and then finally where to place the car. Uh, however, for the task of class unfolding, actually many of the steps has pretty straightforward uh, natural answers. So for example, because we want to unfold the class, so we always want to like basically stretch the class as far as possible, but uh, without tearing the class. And then similarly for the last step, we just want to place the class uh, back down into the workspace in a reasonable place. Um, and uh, the actual location doesn't matter that much. So now what we have left uh, for the learning algorithm is to predict where to grasp and how to flee or how fast to flee. Um, and uh, actually in our real world setup, uh, one thing that we observed um, in order to simplify the problem is that the grasping position is actually much more important uh, than the fling speed or the uh, parameters for the fling. So for example, if we, we actually manually vary the fling height and also the fling speed, um, and the, the system is, uh, as some of the system is able to get a good grasp on the class, uh, they are able still, still able to kind of achieve a very good unfolding performance. So uh, for example, in this case, we kind of change the fling speed and height, but we always ask the system to grasp on the shoulders, the, the fling, uh, the um, unfolding performance doesn't change that much. So based on this observation, we uh, further simplified the, the pipeline or the primitive, basically by using a fixed uh, fling speed, but then focus the learning on choosing where to grasp or like predicting the grasping point. So what we just did uh, is basically reducing the task of learning a very complex fling primitive into a, a much simpler task, uh, which is learning uh, how to find a good grasping point to support fling action to do the task of unfolding. However, uh, just this simple task of learning uh, a good grasping strategy is still kind of tricky, especially if we think about uh, the system has involved two arms and is going to execute a tool by manual manipulation. So in particular, in order to, to avoid the collisions between these two arms, the two grasping points still need to satisfy it, uh, a set of constraints. So for example, uh, the, uh, one of the constraints they need to satisfy is crossover constraint, which, well, which means that the left arm should always stay in the left and the right arm should stay in the right uh, inside a crossover, so that's uh, more likely to cause collision. And the, the second constraint is that the grasp width means that the two grasping points shouldn't be too far away or too close to each other. Um, again, it's trying to avoid a collision. So given these two constraints, what we need to do is to design our uh, action parameterization so that it can easily satisfy those constraints. So a straightforward formulation will be directly predicting the left and right of uh, grasping point independently. However, those constraints will, like the, the two constraints I just talked about, will uh, get entangled together and uh, under this formulation. And it will get a little bit messy in order to filter out those invalid uh, predictions afterwards. So instead, what we choose to use another formulation, which basically predicts the center point of the left and right grasping point, and then uh, we'll, uh, and then additionally, we'll predict the angle between these uh, two grasping points as a theta, and also the grasping width w. So this parameterization will allow us to uh, easily compute the left and right grasping point with simple uh, trigonometry that always satisfies all the constraints that we want the system to follow. Uh, so after this uh, change of formulation, all the system need to learn is the parameters of the center position, uh, position C, uh, the orientation theta, and also W. And then we can, of course, directly predicting those uh, three parameters However, we can, again, um, significantly improve the learning efficiency by injecting some inductive bias to the learning process. So in, in particular, we observe that for the task of class unfolding, the best, uh, the best grasping positions has a few equivalence with respect to the input uh, that we want to maintain. So for example, the grasping position should be a uh, translational uh, equivalent, which means that if the class is shipped around in a workspace, the grasp point should shift together with it. Uh, similarly, it should also be equivalent to rotation and scale. So in order to kind of maintain this equivalence in the input and output representation, we use a spatial action map as the value network in order to uh, evaluate all the grasp candidates. So the key idea for a spatial action map is that whenever we want to kind of reasoning about the rotation uh, scales uh, in the output, we can offload those reasoning into transforming the input image. So in other words, instead of uh, rotating and uh, scaling the grasp parameter in the end, or the in output representation, we can rotate and scale the input uh, image 
and then uh, try to infer the score for a fixed grasping parameter. So here is how we actually apply uh, this uh, skill, uh, spatial action map idea in uh, this fling primitives. So given an input image um, that's captured from the top-down um, camera, we can scale and rotate this image to obtain a collection of transformed input image. Uh, where the scale will uh, corresponding to the grasp width uh, W and the rotation will corresponding to the different grasping angles. And then the output is a dense value map where each pixel will corresponding to one possible center locations for the two-arm grasp, which is labeled as C. And then the, the action selection basically is done by simply pick the pixel with the highest grasp value among all the scales and the rotations. And then the value network is trained to predict the delta surface area with self surface learning that we described earlier. So um, that's the, the high level idea of our algorithm. And then now I'm going to kind of just quickly show you some of the real world experiments and also the comparisons with other baselines. Um, so here we actually compared our system fling ball with a system that's uh, also used two arm, but only limited to use a pick and place actions. And then below we actually plot out the class coverage with respect to the interaction steps, uh, which basically shows the efficiency of the whole system. As you can see in this example, uh, Flingba is able to fully unfold the, the clock uh, within three steps, uh, where the pick and place uh, system is going to take a while to get to a good performance. And here is another example of a uh, comparison. Uh, I think in this case, the, the cost is much longer than the previous example. And the uh, Flingba, again, is able to uh, unfold this class within three interaction steps. And uh, I think here is a generalization test for um, uh, applying pulling ball on uh, t-shirts. So actually we will only train our system on rectangular class, both in simulation and in real world. Uh, so it actually never really see um, a class with different shapes, but seems that it's able to generalize reasonably well for different garments that is now trained on. So here are just more results videos. Um, and of course you can check out more videos on our uh, website. Uh, it's actually pretty interesting to look at uh, those videos and see how Flingba well, uh, works in, in reality. And here is a little bit more quantitative result and comparisons. Uh, we compare with two different quasi-static baselines uh, such as pick and place and pick and drag. And uh, we also can, uh, include a variant of our approach of uh, basically Flingba well, that also learns the fling speed. Right. So in, in all the uh, examples that we show, we actually have a fixed fling speed, but we do try uh, an, another version that um, actually requires the optimal fling speed for different cloud. Uh, and we actually train that with reinforcement learning. However, we can see that uh, it's only marginally improved the performance and in, in some cases. So actually in the end, we, we uh, select the simpler version that does not predict our fling speed as our final approach. Okay, so to summarize, uh, I think the most surprising thing that we learned uh, through developing Flingbot is that even without any explicit modeling of the class states or using any complex learning strategies, Flingbot is able to uh, work very well for the task of class unfolding. And I think the simplicity of our approach really uh, underscores the key uh, takeaways for Flingbot, which is um, dynamic actions are really good for um, class unfolding, at least for this task. And then to address the challenges associated with learning, we introduce the action parameterization that provides a, a, the two-arm collision and also learn a value network that exploit or leverage the equivalence of the problem structure in order to improve the learning efficiency. So um, is it, uh, I, I want to pause here and see if there any uh, questions from the uh, audience for the first product we about. Lily, um, I see you raise your hand. Yeah, yeah, hi. Uh, so I had a question about the fact that you're keeping the fling speed fixed um, and it doesn't, con and you said it doesn't contribute much to- uh, Sorry, I can, I, I have a little bit trouble hearing you. Can I be a little bit louder? Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I wanted to ask about like uh, keeping the fling speed fixed. Uh, and you said it doesn't contribute much to learning it. I, I wanted to see if like in the data set of the clots, uh, the clots had like a very uniform weight and density and that's why this is happening. And uh, like for heavier tasks, like if there was uh, more 
different uh, rates of clots uh, learning the fling speed would help. That's correct. That's uh, that. I think your intuition is correct. And actually, in the later in the in the last uh, part, I was gonna show if the class actually has a very uh, uh, large like variance in terms of distribution of their density uh, or like the, the mass. Um, it it do matters to learn the correct uh, fling speed. And I think it's just in particular for the test uh, for the objects we test on, they actually has a very similar um, type of material. Therefore, one fling speed is sufficient. Yeah. And I had another question, uh, like uh, for um, the part that you uh, said for uh, learning uh, different rotation and scales you are using, like augmentation kind of uh, thing that you generate different scales and rotations and feed into the network. And there are some uh, new like networks that use uh, like invariant filters uh, for rotation and scale. Did you like try those and like see if they fail? Yeah. So. Let, uh, let me try to answer. I think that's a, a great question. So uh, first of all, I think there, uh, there is a big key difference on learning invariance and equivariance. So if you want to learn something invariant, means that you, no matter how you rotate the image, you want to predict the same glass in the line. But it's actually not the case. We want the output also uh, is equivalent to the input transformation. Um, but there indeed, there are new networks that are designed that actually preserve this kind of equivalence in the network. So you, we actually don't need to explicitly augment the input image. Uh, so there are equivalent networks that uh, I think um, more recent work is coming out. And I think, yeah, it's interesting to kind of apply those methods in this kind of problem and uh, uh, see how we can leverage those equivalence in a more natural and direct way. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. So There's one more question, I believe, from Cameron. Uh, this is slightly cheeky is, how well does it generalize to different materials? For example, he says, uh, oh, okay. Uh, uh, Lily already asked this one. So uh, I do have one question here uh, that we found the paper very interesting, particularly the Flingbot idea, um, because you were picking these sort of actions in, in a certain order or sense. Um, does this system need to be closed loop? Because right now, I think the trick or the trick of the success here is to make the process uh, learn dynamics, but in a, in a sort of like slow one movement at a time kind of thing, right? You're not learning the continuous dynamics or not operating at high speed uh, during the movement. Yeah. Exactly. So how important that might be or what, what this may or may not be able to do uh, from an approach perspective. Yeah. yeah, from a that perspective, I think it's definitely will be good to actually consider this kind of uh, high speed controller, closed loop controllers. Um, but I think that will also have, uh, have a very high requirements in, in terms of like the, the robot controller, the sensor uh, speed, and also the processing speed. Uh, I think, yeah, so I, I think that's definitely a promising direction. It's just like, it's still a bit like, it's so hard. Uh, <laughs> that's we, we try to kind of look away. And in the, in the last part, that we try to do it in a more close loop manner, but it's not as close loop as what you think. But uh, in that case, is we try to like observe the outcome of the action and then see how to adjust the action. But it's still for each of the action is still relatively open loop. But we'll see how in, in the uh, last. First of all, thank you for being honest and, and sharing the details. I don't want to derail the derail your talk. I think there's like a bunch of more exciting stuff. Let's let's pause the questions and we'll come back to them. Okay, sounds good. Uh, yeah. And actually, yeah, my next slide is actually about the limitation for fling bars. So I, I really don't want to uh, give you the wrong impression that a fling bar can actually solve all the cost uh, like unfolding tasks. Um, that's definitely not true. So actually, one of the uh, typical uh, um, yeah, one of the uh, typical failure case is when the cost is uh, much larger and heavier, uh, right? So when the robots uh, we are not able to produce a sufficient speed to fully unfold um, costs. So I think in this case, I, I contribute a, a, a address to, for, for the fling bar and the, the fling bar actually has trouble to fully unfold it. At, at most, it can half unfold it uh, because the speed limit for UR5 robots. And then for this robot, we cannot further improve the speed. But even if we have a robot that can uh, execute action much faster, at some point, it will become too dangerous, uh, especially if they need to execute those kind of action along human. So that is one of the limitations uh, for this, uh, this kind of framework. And then in our follow-up work, we try to kind of address this problem uh, by introducing error dynamics. 
So uh, we actually call it dexterity, basically uh, adding like a blower into the system. So in this work, we let the ro another robot, a third robot, uh, that's able to additionally control an air blower and then learn a closed loop policy that control the direction of the blower. So in this case, the system can easily unfold a diverse set of clouds, including this very large uh, dress. Uh, and also um, you can like note that all of these three uh, robot arms, now we can kind of replace them with much cheaper and uh, slower hardware because we no longer re require very fast and precise robot movements. Um, and uh, this air pump actually you can just buy it from Amazon with $20. Uh, so that actually solved most of the failure cases in Ukraine. Uh, in and of course, uh, in addition to cost unfolding, I think this direction of air based manipulation can also apply to many other applications. Uh, such as uh, opening a deformable bag or blowing leaves uh, or small particles uh, into a target area. So it's actually two uh, works that's demonstrating different type of applications. And I think in general, the idea is that um, error-based manipulation can allow the system to kind of simultaneously apply uh, a, a dense force in a 3D space without any direct contact on objects that the system tries to manipulate. Um, so I think this is actually a pretty unique advantage com compared to contact-based manipulation. And I think that's a very interesting uh, like direction to kind of explore more using air to manipulate objects. And uh, in today's talk, I'm not going to go into details of Dex RIT, but um, you can feel free to check out uh, the website and see the demos uh, on, on the website. Um, and apart from um, the limitation we talked about, which is like handling large fabrics, uh, another limitation for Flingbot uh, is that um, it's limited capability in handling goal condition tasks uh, with high precision requirement. And it's actually also kind of related to like handling different um, class or fabrics with very different physical properties. Um, because um, for, for those kind of uh, system, you actually need to really adjust the fling speed or the actual control in order to achieve a certain goal conditions. And uh, in the cross unfolding task, it's actually a much simplified problem that we are trying to address, whereas the algorithm only need to care about the total coverage and without really worry about the actual configurations of the garment. Uh, so here you basically see that all these comp uh, configurations that the system achieved is considered as equally good by the, by the algorithm, but uh, obviously they are not good enough for many real world applications. So for example, if you want to fold them, then some of those configurations is actually uh, not enough, right? We actually, uh, in many applications, we want uh, the end configuration to be satisfied certain um, goal conditions. And um, so uh, in the next project, uh, we're gonna kind of focus on um, another categories of a much harder task, which is goal conditions. Um, so what is a goal condition task, uh, especially in the context of deformable object manipulation? So here I'm showing you two types of those tasks. One is kind of uh, whipping a rope to hit a target position. And the other is a swing a table class to a target uh, configuration. So in both tasks, the goal condition is defined by the target key point positions. And then the key point is either uh, the tip of the rope in the first example, or the key points on the class uh, in the second example. And uh, given that the uh, targets are still outside the system's reach range, which means that it still requires the system to use dynamic actions in order to reach to those goals. Uh, Quasi-static action is not sufficient for those kind of tasks. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, there is a good reason that's why we try to avoid this kind of task uh, in the earlier work like Flingbots, um, because we kind of think that uh, those tasks are too hard, and, uh, and we try to look away from those kind of tasks. So why, the, why is that the case? So I think first, uh, unlike quasi-static manipulation, uh, object's motion under dynamic action is actually highly influenced by its physical properties. And at the same time, uh, a deformable object's physical property are defined by many hard to measure properties, such as nonlinear stiffness or density distribution. So as a result, uh, this combo of dynamic and deformable makes it extremely hard or difficult for a robot to plan its action for achieving a very precise goal conditions. So that's why I, we, we, at the beginning, we think this task is really hard. And in fact, um, it is a task that's even uh, kind of challenging for humans. So here is actually a video showing um, oh, my student Cheng is doing this task. So given a new rope or like unknown rope, it's actually very unlikely for us to hit the goal at the first try. Um, but the good thing is that after a few attempts, 
we are oftentimes able to get closer and closer to the goal and eventually able to reach to the goal. So I guess the question is that, what do we learn through this process of iteratively trying to reach to the goal? Um, do we try to predict the full trajectory from each of different actions? Um, I think probably not, at least I, I, I was not able to do that. And or are we trying to kind of explicitly decode uh, the raw parameters like the nonlinear densities or stiffness? Uh, I guess probably not either. So what we actually learned, I think, uh, or rely on, I think it's kind of like this a good intuition or prior knowledge about how to adjust our action in order to affect the trajectory of the rope. So for example, we kind of know that if we swing harder, um, the rope will be able to go higher. And then if we extend our arm more, we are able to let the rope uh, reach to a further uh, location. So, and then uh, in the end, we basically rely on this intuition in order to adjust our action, in order to get closer and closer to the goal. So in this work, uh, we, call, oops, we call this uh, intuition uh, residual dynamics. And our hypothesis is that the knowledge uh, about this kind of change, uh, like how we change the action will affect the trajectory, is much easier for the algorithm to learn and also potentially more transferable to different ropes. Right? So if we change the different rope, the trajectory will be different, but the change or at least the direction will be similar. So that knowledge can be transferred to a new object. So based on this uh, idea or intuition, uh, we uh, designed this algorithm called re uh, iterative residual policy. So at its core, uh, the algorithm basically learn a residual dynamics model that take into observed trajectory of a rope and a data action uh, that we plan to apply on, on our current action. And then the, uh, what's the net or the uh, residual dynamics model need to predict is a new trajectory that update the, the observed trajectory um, with the delta action applied on the current action. Right, so uh, here, the robot action we, uh, is parameterized with the target joint angles and the maximum joint speed. And then uh, we will basically, what the algorithm will, uh, after the, uh, the residual dynamics is trained, what the algorithm needs to do is by sampling different type of um, uh, delta actions and then try to predict their corresponding uh, resulting trajectories and then the algorithm could iteratively select the better actions uh, that would get closer to the goal. So here is uh, basically the selected best data action, and then we'll apply this data action on top of the current action, uh, and then uh, use that action for the next iteration. Uh, so that I, hopefully if the direction is correct, eventually the system will be able to converge to a good solution that's able to produce a correct action that reached to the goal. And the one thing to note is that the whole uh, residual dynamics model here is actually trained entirely in simulation. Uh, and we'll see later how it's able to kind of adapt to real world. So as you can imagine uh, for this task, there is a huge uh, sim to real gap between the simulated environment and the real world execution. So here is basically um, the trajectory that uh, is actually the same rope, same length, same physical properties, but if you execute the action in simulation or real world, it looks drastically different. Um, but uh, hopefully uh, the learned residual dynamics, especially its general direction, is able, is generalizable to real work and also objects with different uh, physical parameters. So here is a system in action. At each iteration, the rope trajectory is tracked by a calibrated camera. And then the distance to the goal is measured by the shortest distance among the trajectory. And then the algorithm will sample a set of delta actions and predict their trajectories using the learned residual dynamics model. And then finally, the action that's associated with the minimum distance or, um, will be selected for the next iteration. Um, and uh, in this visualization, we always uh, visualize the best action on the top. And then this process will basically continue and repeat until uh, the goal is reached or the maximum iteration is reached. So I think this is the final trajectory after the policy converges and is able to reach to the goal. Um, and in our experiments, we want to kind of systematically evaluate or validate uh, how well the system can generalize. And in specifically, what, how well it can generalize to uh, real world dynamics when we we'll only train in simulation, uh, objects with unknown and new physical parameters, and also even uh, variations on the robot hardware environments. And in all the following experiments, we only, we're gonna uh, show you the results that is the same model trained in simulation. 
So first, I'm going to show the test results on different groups, and many of them is actually significant auto distribution. Uh, for example, on the top right, you can see a long class that has much higher error resistance, and also a whip that has a very uh, non-uniform uh, mass distribution. Um, and in simulation, we use Mujuko, which only allows us to simulate um, a rope with uniform, uh, uniform density distribution. So before I show you the results, I want to again highlight how challenging the task is. So here, I basically show you the rope trajectory that is captured under the same robot action. Uh, however, due to the different physical properties like error resistance, uh, the, result, uh, the resulting trajectory actually varies quite drastically. And therefore, the robot really needs to adapt its policy based on the visual feedback in order to accommodate different physical parameters. So here is the resulting trajectory uh, using the same single model um, and train, uh, using simulation. So this is actually the trajectory after the policy converges. And you can see that the algorithm actually used uh, different actions uh, in order to achieve the same goal in order to accommodate different uh, drop dynamics. And next, we actually further validate the system's generalization capability with respect to different uh, robot hardware. So here we change a uh, one parameter, which is uh, the last, uh, the, uh, the length of robot's last link, which basically changes the mapping between robot's action and its effect. Right? So in this case, the system kind of really forced to adapt or relearn on this, uh, on this new um, embodiment using the new observations captured from the real world. So uh, the, uh, in the middle, the 15 centimeter stick is what we use to generate our training data, which means that the longer and the shorter sticks is actually out of distribution. And then here is the result. So as we can see that uh, for the um, system or the robots with a different uh, link length, they are, they are typically start with much higher error compared to the middle one. Uh, however, regardless, it's able to quickly um, adapt to the, to the system and uh, adjust these um, actions according to the visual feedbacks. And then in the next experiment, we're actually uh, trying to stress test the system uh, and, and especially test its robustness. So what we do is that we first allow the system to converge on a good solution for a given uh, rope and a goal. And then uh, after the system kind of converges, we try to gently interact with the robot by tying a few knots on the rope. So effectively, uh, this few knots will basically change many critical parameters of the rope, such as this linear density, and also most important, even the length of the rope is changed. Uh, so after this kind of interruption, we can immediately observe a much higher error after um, this change. But after two iteration, you can see that the policy is able to quickly adapt uh, to this new system dynamics and regain a good performance for a given goal. So here is uh, some quantitative results or qu uh, quantitative comparisons. And the method on the left is actually a very strong baseline where uh, we, um, the algorithm basically used the optimal action that's optimized in simulation and is actually optimized for each individual ropes with parameters that actually manually measured uh, and modeled in simulation. However, it still results in more than 20 centimeter error, uh, which basically highlights a big sim to real gap for this task. And we also compare with method using system identification and the linear dynamics models. And uh, uh, of course, you can find more uh, details on the paper. Um, but yeah, I think the, the takeaway is that our method is able to achieve much better performance after uh, this kind of iterative adjustment. And then finally, in order to demonstrate the generality of our message, we try to apply the same message uh, to the class placement task with minimal modification. So the goal for this task is to place a class on a table given a target pose. So it's different from floating bar, which is only trying to increase the coverage. Now I actually we care about the, each of the key point locations of the, uh, the class. And uh, the pose, uh, in this case, uh, is defined by nine different key point locations on the class. And uh, again, the algorithm does not know the physical parameters of the class. And we do vary uh, quite drastically on those uh, physical parameters. So here is uh, two examples of typical strategies that's learned by the algorithm. Uh, so in the uh, first case, the algorithm, uh, oh, okay, so in the first step, all, uh, the algorithm start with the same initial action, but because the class has different physical properties, you will see that it actually ends with different uh, end configuration. Um, so in the first example, the class actually lands too close compared to the goal. Uh, and in the second example, 
the same action actually caused the cost to fold by itself due to the high cost densities. And then uh, with that observation, uh, the policy will increase, uh, will, will actually adjust the action differently for different, uh, different scenarios. So for the first case, um, the, uh, the policy basically increases stroke in order to uh, allow the cost to sink further. And, but in the second case, it actually decreases speed in order to prevent uh, the cost to fold um, by itself. And then uh, again, the policy will basically continue to adjust this action until it achieves the goal, um, which typically takes uh, three steps for this task. So um, as you can see, this formulation of iterative residual policy is pretty general, and uh, uh, it can be applied uh, to many uh, repeatable tasks with complex dynamics. So here, I, I kind of want to highlight repeatable because uh, this system kind of rely on the, 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 the reset in order to try it. Uh, different actions. If you have a task that is not able to automatically reset to the initial state, then uh, you may have a little bit of trouble of directly applying this idea. Because every time we'll try a, a different data action, the initial state is no longer the same, which may cause issues when you're trying to learn the uh, residual dynamics. So I think that is one of the limitations I want to highlight. And I think that what we learned from this project is that instead of trying to learn the full dynamics, that's um, kind of directly map from action to its uh, effects, which is the trajectory in this case, the algorithm can learn and make use of a residual dynamics uh, um, that's kind of um, uh, learning how different actions or changing actions will result in different uh, effects on the final trajectories. And then we also show that learning this kind of residual dynamics is much easier to learn and also potentially much more generalizable uh, for different objects that with drastically different physical parameters. And uh, I think, yeah, so basically through our experiments, we demonstrate that the system is able to generalize to many conditions, such as the noisy real-world dynamics, new objects with unseen pra physical parameters, and uh, even uh, robots, different hardware embodiments. So that is about the, this project, re uh, iterative residual policy. So any questions about this project uh, before I go to the summary slides? I think we can pay, we can wait for the questions until then. Okay, no, sounds please. good. Yeah, so it's only a few slides uh, left. So I, I want to summarize uh, um, by basically saying I feel the main or the key takeaway for today's talk is I, I hope to convince you that the importance and benefits of using uh, incorporate dynamic actions in deformable object manipulation. And uh, I think the reason is that by leveraging dynamics or accelerations in action, the system now is able to address one of the core challenge uh, for deformable object manipulation, which is uh, caused by its under actuation or high degree of freedoms. And uh, if you care about the details of how to make it work, uh, so here are some practical lessons that we learned from our projects. So I think first, uh, in order to handle like the action uh, sequence complexity, we often design and use different action primitives that map uh, a very complex and um, uh, action sequence into a low dimensional parameterization, uh, which is much easier to learn. Right. So, for example, we simplify, uh, we simplify the problem of learning the complex fling action uh, into predicting where to grasp. And then in the last project, we uh, parameterize the whole uh, swing actions with its target joint angle and speed. So that uh, re really helps to reduce the complexity of learning uh, dynamic action sequence. And uh, also to handle, in order to handle uh, objects complex dynamics, uh, we can we could always benefit from uh, using more uh, feedback controls and simplify the learning problem by using residual dynamics, which is much easier to learn and also generalizable, especially compared to learning the full dynamics model that's rely on accurate system identification, which almost never able to happen uh, in, in in real world with the uh, deformable objects. And I think finally, in order to handle this kind of big sim to real gap, we could uh, leverage either self-supervised learning, uh, directly learn from real world, or uh, online ad adaptation, like what we do in the iterative residual policy. Um, and uh, I think that's the end of my talk. I'm happy to take questions. And yeah. This is wonderfully done. Thank you so much, Yuran. I think this is... <laughs> There are so many interesting papers and works. Uh, but before we start with this, I think let's start with questions. We have about five minutes for questions before we, we can give you a break. Florian, go ahead. 
Hi, Shuran. This was a very, very uh, enjoyable talk um, and very thought provoking as well. Um, I, I, one of the things that I started thinking about as you were describing the differences between the residual uh, policy learning and the, or actually the residual dynamics and the, um, and the system identification uh, was, I mean, there, there's a large variety of CISID methods some of which rely on point estimates, other, others rely on you know, posterior estimates of uh, parameters. So when we, when we sort of say that um, residual dynamics performs better at the end than uh, CISID, uh, exactly what type of CISID do we mean in this type of work? Yeah, we try to feel a uh, different, uh, well, I, I think we try pretty naive CISID uh, methods. So basically we, uh, we train a network that's try to decode uh, the parameters that, I, that, that we care about for uh, deformable like ropes actually. And are we actually able to do this task uh, you know, more controlled way in simulation because we know what are the parameters that we actually uh, need to predict and can control. So we uh, basically train a decoder that decodes that, uh, that few parameters and then we use that field parameter to train a policy that's able to adjust the action or predict the action. So that is a, um, the, the very naive baseline that we implement for this ID comparison uh, is in simulation, yeah. So would you, would you expect, but the, I think the, the broad question of how much should you trust CISID in general, even in the distribution sense of posterior over parameters, uh, I think it's a very valid question to, to think about whether that's the right approach for modeling, uh, you know, some part of the dynamics of, uh, of, these, uh, uh, of these deformable objects. So do you, do you see value in getting sort of, um, uh, I guess, dynamics models or um, distributions over possible dynamics models uh, of, of these objects? Or do you uh, essentially, do you think that this residual dynamics approach can be scaled up to be uh, you know, to, to be useful in various situations without actually having to model the... the yeah, I, I definitely feel like the system identification method still can play a, a pretty important role, especially for the parameters that's easier to model and also like the, the physics is actually easy to model. So for example, for rope, there are cases, like there are parameters that's really hard to measure, really hard to model, like there are resistance, but there are also like things like the lens is actually really easy to, to actually model and it actually controls a large portion of the behaviors. And then I think with those kind of easy to model a, a parameter and maybe combined with learning that's able to model those hard to measure, how to model uh, parameters, there are, I think there are definitely better methods um, that we can develop. So I think the residual dynamics is like one, um, one step towards that though, uh, but I think, yeah, there are definitely more work to be done. Gotcha, thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Other questions? So let me ask a different question to Shuran. And, and a lot of the works that you've done, particularly, for example, Flingbot, and even some of the other ones, let's say uh, ones before right, that you were working on, often use this core idea of dense prediction. So you would basically take a CNN sort of image, and then uh, you're predicting kind of a heat map, if you will, or an attention directly, which yeah. is very different from a lot of the approaches that people have taken, which where, where they're explicitly predicting like X, Y, or something like that. Um, why did you pick that particular design choice? Was there a particular intuition? Because this design choice is a recurrent theme in your work. Uh, so, so there must be like a technical reason. I hope so. Yeah, yeah. So actually, uh, I, I tried to explain a little bit on the like the, the flame bar uh, size. So I think one of, so it's actually, after we apply in so many different tasks, we, we think back why it works so well, right? So I think one of the reasons that we, we realized is that through this dense prediction, it actually really well preserved this equivalence in terms of input and output, especially if you use a convolution neural network, it preserves the translational equivalence. Um, means that your prediction on location directly anchored on the uh, visual input. And that is actually really good properties for many tasks like grasping, where you basically need to just detect the local geometries. Um, and uh, similarly, like the reason that we're, why we're doing this kind of rotating uh, image is also, again, try to preserve the equivalence between the input and output. So I think that is probably like one of the reasons why we, we, we found this method uh, works really well. Uh, it's actually very simple efficient because it's able to kind of in, uh, inject this uh, inductive bias in the, in the network. Would this, would this idea of dense prediction also work where the input was, let's say, 
a set of point clouds or maybe some sort of a 3D representation? Yeah, definitely. I think we tried uh, we we tried both voxels and also um, a point cloud. Uh, the difficulty of scaling it up to 3D is always a, on the rotation prediction. Once we so first of all, it's uh, the the if you represent it as 3D voxels, then you can predict the location pretty well, and you like you can use convolution neural network. But once you start to think about location, then the space becomes a lot larger. And the, the naive approach of like rotating the input doesn't really work that well. So I think that is a challenge. Uh, but also there is like I see I see new hope, which is all those like equivalent 3D network that I think uh, give us the new opportunities of using same idea but a more elegant formulation. Yeah. Wonderful. We are at the end of time, but I will do a last call for questions. Anybody? If not, no worries. Uh, Florian, do you have one? Yeah, maybe a general question about, uh, about, the, about the field. So what do you think is missing from current, uh, you know, deformable object simulators that you would love, you would love to have? Yeah, I, I, I think there, there, there is a lot of work to be done in that, in that area. Um, so for example, I, I, I think one, one big challenge is to simulate the realistic interaction between deformable and rigid objects. I think uh, actually, I think at least for the power that we try to use, it, we, we always need to make a decision of whether we only want to simulate deformable objects or, or rigid objects. It's actually kind of hard to simulate their interactions very realistically together. I know that uh, Avidia's new simulator actually potentially can address this issue. I haven't like, invested deep enough, uh, but I, I think that's one other thing coming to my mind. And there are also a lot of other things like aerodynamics. Um, I didn't talk into details about uh, the dexterity project, but we actually simulated a you know, very like, naive and simplified version of basically shoot particles as if that's air, but that's not a real uh, like aerodynamics at all. Like it doesn't simulate Bernoulli effect, for example. So all those things, I think, ideally, it can, can have in the new generations of simulators. Got it. Thank you. Cool. I would like to thank Shuran again uh, for the wonderful talk, for such patient question answering. And even more importantly, I would say, for being so honest about what works and what doesn't. Uh, so, so this is very refreshing. Thank you so much. Thank you all in the audience for, for being here today. Uh, and we hope to see you in the next meeting for Robotics 7.0.